the notion of mimesis, perhaps, I mean, you're probably the in-house Juridian here, Thomas, so please, if you could, uh, you know, yeah, <laughs> enlighten, <laughs> enlighten us on, yeah, why why bring René Girard's ideas into this at all? Like, I get the whole, I think the notion of abstraction, uh, most people who work in programming kind of get it almost intuitively. I mean, in all PV even have abstraction as a, as a principle, right, um, in object-oriented programming. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when we speak of someone like, uh, yeah, why why even bring the work of uh, René Girard into this conversation? Well, because because you can kind of see that abstraction ties in with with mimesis. Um, if it becomes easier and easier to to um, to use these types of technologies, then it also becomes easier and easier to kind of be um, to kind of be influenced by by these models. Um, that that people use to kind of direct their desire. So uh, desire is is triangular. You want things because somebody else wants it as well. And these types of dynamics are now incredibly powerful in the world of machine learning. Um, and they are they are. It's it's. I think it's it's kind of very interesting thing. And specifically think about this. Um, First of all, you have all these powerful models. You have all these these superstars of, of deep learning, of machine learning. You have these very large companies that are very good at, at uh, capturing people's attention. And that then ties in with software that is increasingly easy to use. So that kind of creates kind of a feedback, feedback loop, like you have very powerful models that people imitate. But it also becomes easier and easier to, 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 to do the imitation. And so that means that you kind of have the, the tendency for things to converge towards specific practices that then attract an enormous amount of people. And often these uh, attractors the, the, or the, um, let's say, the gravitas of these at attractors might not be, um, it might, their, their importance or, or their effic efficacy might not warrant that. So in, in other words, it might be some methods and some, uh, uh, some uh, developments might be attractive because of these uh, mimetic mechanism, not so much because the technologies themselves are so incredibly powerful. And I think that we see that now with large language models, right? So this, 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 all this talk about uh, artificial general intelligence, so we're almost there, we just need to make the, the, the models a bit bigger and then maybe, you know, like uh, to fine tune them a bit more and then they will suddenly be reliable and capable of reasoning. I find that quite mind boggling. I think that that will definitely not happen. And one of the predictions that I make, and I, I will do that now, I think that this year will be um, probably the uh, the big disappointment with what the large language models can do. That's a fantastic technology, deeply impressive. I use it a lot, and especially in bioinformatics, they've made an enormous uh, an enormous impact. But I think that they have very important limitations, and the reason that people don't really want to see that, or that that they have such a such an attraction, is I think mimetic. Mm, yeah, I can car. I can car. Yeah, I mean, I, I was thinking about this notion of, again, pertaining to abstraction. In some sense, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, isn't all, I mean, especially as in, in a Hegelian, isn't, isn't, isn't all thinking in some sense like a social abstraction? As in, uh, like, if we take how knowledge works, let me see if I could uh, articulate myself here. So, obviously, um, none of us can ever be an expert at every single discipline in in the modern world, right? Not everyone can be an expert in physics and anthropology and biology. Uh, maybe the last like great mind, like the kind of polymath type was probably Leibniz, who had like just worked across multiple fields. So in some sense, the way anyone working in like be it academia or any kind of like knowledge work to use that term, is that we use an input of the work that someone has already done and we take like an abstract concept um, and then we uh, we import that into the work we're doing. So an, an example here would be, uh, let's say something like uh, evolutionary psychology. Um, a psychologist might not have studied uh, evolution the way a biologist has in like a deep sense, you know, like studying the animals and like doing all the research in a very systematic, meticulous manner, but rather would just 
read a paper written by some biologist, let's say, or an evolutionary biologist, and just take like an like an like the gist or the abstract concept of it, and then apply that to kind of the work they're doing. Uh, so, and this is where like I'm interested to see how, like in in your view, is the abstraction you speak of here pertaining to let's say computer science and uh, and AI, is it qualitatively different to the kind of the already the what I see as the abstraction that exists in our let's call it social epistemology or how 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 knowledge works in some sense in human society as like a collective enterprise or is it still a part of the same um same same mo or same 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 framework let's say or, or or the same i'm trying to think of a word here um kind of the same spirit let's say uh, if, if that makes sense so uh, did, did my my question make sense there Kyle? Yeah, yeah, totally. So I think that in a roundabout way, I'm going to try and respond to you here by suggesting that what's going on here, at least from my perspective, is that an entire uh, paradigm change in terms of technology uh, is forcing us to reconsider our underlying social epistemology. Mm. If that makes sense. So I just start by saying that in regards to what you were saying about Leibniz as sort of the last polymath and, and sort of entering in this world of the necessity of specialization. For a long time now, our institutions have struggled to uh, accommodate more general thinkers yeah. like a Leibniz, right? And even this might be related to what I was mentioning previously about philosophy and philosophers often falling out of, on the periphery of institutions because those philosophers or that philosophical thinking needs to happen, but it's so general in a, in a certain way and so hard to categorize and contain in a certain way that it can only be recouped by the institutions retroactively. So the way in which institutions currently function is through this specialization mechanism where you know people are doing very specialized work in technology for example and then that chain but but then that 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 has a huge social effect and, and we're seeing this increasing tra transformation uh, of our societies driven by uh, technological transformations which are coming from from specialization and i mean i think you know the example that you're describing in your situation is is a really good one in a sense because you know you're in the institutions you're saying, I'm going to keep studying cog sci or artificial intelligence in the institutions, but I need to get the more philosophical speculative work. I can't find it in the institutions. So I have to go to uh, a, a, an entity that's operating in some sense outside on the periphery of the institutions, right? So there's this, there's this weird relationship that's at work between, let's say, the technological paradigms and the underlying social epistemology that's going on. And I think that this is kind of like what we're, you know, my understanding of the abstraction explosion is it's kind of like a very radical application of thinking about uh, punctuated equilibrium uh, or even Kuhnian paradigm shifts, that it's not just a paradigm shift just purely on a theory level, but it's, it's uh, on the level where uh, theory is changing the actual actuality of technology, which is then changing the basic life world in which we inhabit. And so there's all this at play, and it's just a matter of how do we now think about um, the form of cognition we need to cultivate in order to handle this surprise, this discontinuity, this, this disruption, so to speak.